Hi, Marissa. I'm so glad to have you here. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm far away from you. I'm going to take off my mask so that you can hear me just a little bit better. Um, I'm going to pray over our time together, and then we're going to go ahead and get started. Let's go ahead and bow your heads. Holy Father, we just come before you tonight, Lord, and we are just so excited to be here together, Lord. We are um, just overwhelmed with joy for everyone that's here, Lord. And God, I just pray that um, your words would come um, from me tonight, Lord, that I would be glorifying to you and that um, all the glory would be yours, Lord. We love you and we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. Awesome. So when I was about 12 years old, around sixth grade, I came home from school and my mom was just a little too excited. She told me to go downstairs and say hi to my Uncle Stan. And when I went downstairs, there was um, a cute little black and white puppy. I was a little in shock. I had been wanting a puppy for a long time, but I did not think that my parents would ever make it happen. I'll never forget fe the feeling of surprise and shock getting to hug my new puppy, Sam, and play with him. This gift was, it was unexpected. It was really undeserved. My actions had not proven to my parents that I deserved a puppy. Um, but instead of out of love, my parents trusted me to take care of and love on this little puppy. Just like I did not deserve a puppy, we are sinful humans and deserve nothing but, honestly, God's wrath. But we were given an unexpected gift beyond our imagination. Redemption through God's Son, a renewed relationship with God, and the promise of eternal life with Him. All this God gave us out of love. During the next 30 weeks, together we will unpack the, and this part of God's story. The Gospel of Matthew is the unexpected account of the unexpected King, Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah. Jesus was given to this world to an unexpected family line in an unexpected way as a baby born of a virgin with an unexpected arrival in a manger in 12 to, and sorry a manger and visited by unexpected worshipers. As he began his ministry, his closest followers, his 12 disciples, were an unexpected and unexpected group of men. They were ordinary, unlike Jesus, but he took unexpected acts actions. He overturned tables in the temple. He challenged the thinking of the religious leaders. He taught how people should live in unexpected ways and healed the sick who expected to be ill until death. Jesus unexpectedly taught to love your enemies and to live in humility, forgiveness and grace, and amid persecution. Jesus fulfilled the law in an unexpected way. He lived the perfect life we could not live because the perfect atoning sacrifice we could not offer and defeated death, we have no power to overcome. And he gave us access to eternal kingdom. If you join us for Genesis last year, we know that the Lord's people did not always follow his ways, but who expected that God himself would come to live among and be condemned and crucified by his people so that we can live with him in glory forever. This is an unexpected story, the true account of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. This is the Gospel of Matthew. Tonight, I'm going to forecast this new BSF study year as we look at the unexpected account of the majesty of God and then the unexpected account of the person of God. So first, we're going to talk about the unexpected account of the majesty of God. Last year, we, as I said before, we studied Genesis, the beginning of creation and mankind. However, Genesis was also the beginning of sin with the Lord's redemption and restoration of his people. We know that the restoration of his people will be um, finished in the final book of the Bible, which is Revelation. This year, we are also studying a new beginning, the beginning of the New Testament, the Gospels, the life of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We know that in the Gospels that Jesus creates the new covenant, the new and renewed relationship between God and those who believe in Jesus Christ. Matthew is a transition from the Old Testament to the New, not only in where it falls in the Bible, but also in God's narrative. We move from God's promises and prophecies of the Old Testament to the deliverance of these promises with the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We see this transition as we read about Jesus' genealogy and his unexpected family line. Make sure that you tune in next week to hear about how important this long list of names is. 
This opening genealogy demonstrates a major theme in Matthew, the introduction of the unexpected king, Jesus Christ. Matthew is one of the four Gospels in the Bible. Each of these Gospels record and tell the times of Jesus Christ to open the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are considered synoptic Gospels because they share a common view. Also, several stories of Jesus' life each appear in more than one of these Gospels. However, the Gospel of John is different, where more than three-fourths of the Gospel is focused more on the identity of Christ versus the synoptic Gospels that focus more on what Jesus did and what he said. We know that the Bible is a progression from creation to restorative promises of the new heaven and the new earth, and we see throughout Matthew many Old Testament scriptures. Matthew shows that Jesus Christ accomplished and would accomplish what God had promised. In Matthew, more than the other Gospels, there are 40 Old Testament quotes, many that specifically point out what was done to fulfill prophecy. This Gospel and all the New Testament interact with them more than the other Gospels. Also, the book of Matthew serves a pivotal point to Jesus offering faith to the Gentiles. This interaction is fascinating as Jesus' family line contains three Gentile women, Tamar, Rahab, and Ruth. Along with these three women, we are also amazed at the unexpected worshipers, the wise men, and we end the Gospel of Matthew with Jesus after his resurrection and just before his ascension, to heavenly commanding his ascension to heaven, commanding his followers in what's known as the Great Commission to take the good news of Jesus to all nations. How dynamic is our God? While Jesus' main goal is to establish his kingship as a son of David, we also see his beauty and power on display. He is the Son of God, reflecting his relationship with the Father. He is also the son of man, reflecting perfect humanity of Jesus, the one who must suffer and die for our sins. For we know that Jesus is also Lord, the master of his followers in all creation, the one to whom all knees will bow and tongues confess. We see the majesty of God with Jesus's identity established, son of God, son of man, Lord and King, fulfilling the Old Testament prophecies. Jesus alone then has the authority to establish how his people are to obey, how they're to live, how are they to follow him. He has unexpected authority, authority to share in his teachings that have eternal life, that offer eternal life and salvation. It requires doing the will of God. But we all know that no one can fulfill this law perfectly. We need Jesus, the only one to fulfill the law perfectly, which allows him to be the necessary sacrifice to cover our sins. Not only is Jesus the perfect follower of the law, he is the perfect fulfillment of it too. Through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, our sins are forgiven, and we have renewed relationship with God as the barrier of sin has been lifted. Through faith in Jesus, we are given the Holy Spirit to live in us, give us power to overcome sin. We do not live sinless lives, but instead forgiven lives, spurred on by the desire to obey. This merciful forgiveness and new life in Jesus is the new covenant, the entering of a new era that will be fulfilled when Jesus comes again. Our redemption is based on God's grace and not on how well we can follow the law. This is the part of the good news of the gospel. What a majestic God. He has had this all planned since the beginning of the age. The Bible tells the story, the grand narrative of God's plan and purpose for his people. We find clues and understanding of what God thinks by going, by, excuse me, by going through the Bible. The Holy Spirit helps us understand what God is saying. God used Matthew and 40 human authors to compose these 66, book, 66 books to tell his story, which is our story. God's eternal truth, as recorded here, never changes and meets his people where they are and has the power to transform us. We know that the Bible is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword that judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Hebrews 4.12 
as we enter this new BSF year, I encourage you to partake in the blessings that God has to offer you as you dive into his word. Maybe that looks like setting apart a time of the day to spend alone time with the Lord, exploring his word and letting the lesson questions be your guide. Maybe that is sitting in silence and solitude and listening for the Lord's voice. Or maybe it's reflecting on an important part of scripture that has been speaking to you or talking with a friend about what's going on in your faith walk. Whatever this year may look like, I encourage you to sit in the phenomenal blessing of the gospel of Matthew. God has so much for you to grow and mature as a Christ follower. He has placed the Bible in your life to create heart transformation and move you to live out your faith. If you want to know God, you will find him in his word. So the first principle for tonight is God displays his majesty throughout all his word. God displays his majesty throughout all of his word. For me, the Bible became alive around when I entered high school. I began to truly understand the songs I'd sung at church and the importance of being in the word, not just during Sunday school. This Gospel of Matthew is a bridge from the Old and the New Testament. It helps show the promised and anticipated events prophesied in the Old Testament, like the kingly rule of the Messiah over God's people, which you know as a church. Actually, the term church is first introduced in Matthew as it demonstrates that Jesus and his church are the fulfillment of God's promises to Israel and beyond Israel. We know that this fulfillment would come through the Son of God, the Son of Man, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, the one who was expected to come and reign then and forever. But we know that Jesus came unexpectedly, that he lived unexpectedly, that he ruled unexpectedly. God came personally to his people, and Jesus died personally and reigns eternally in us. For our second principle, let's talk about Jesus, the person. We know that Jesus is God. Just look at his miracles and his resurrection. But we also know that Jesus was human. Jesus wept. He was tempted. He got hangry. But most importantly, he loved. Jesus is not a distant being, but he is majestic, approachable, and he is personal. He called his disciples with a simple phrase, follow me. And with faith, they were transformed. And so can we. Jesus is unexpected. He encounters his people in a new and different way. He comes humbly as we see him be baptized by John the Baptist in chapter three in Matthew. He went into the desert and faithfully had held up the word of the Lord against the devil in chapter four. Throughout the book of Matthew, Jesus didn't call the best of the best, but called the unexpected, the indistinguishable to follow him. Jesus is a master speaker. He shares with us the truth of the Lord and reminds us to set our standards high, to live righteously, not to be anxious or to judge, teaches us how to pray, unexpectedly tells us to love our enemies. The list goes on and on. Jesus is not an impersonal God. He calmed the storm. He confronted the Pharisees. He commended a despised Canaanite woman for her faith. He fed 40 Four thousand. He welcomed the little children. He convicted Judas, confronted the high priest and Pilate. He watched the crowd of soldiers mock him and surrendered his spirit to the Father. Jesus meets people where they are and gives them exactly what they need. He is compassionate. He is truth. He's also tough love. He's mercy and he's justice. Jesus' love for his people and enemies is so deep that he gave his life on the cross and said in Luke 23, 4, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. But this is the good news, because the story does not end there. He rose from the dead and brought death-defying new life. He empowers us with the Great Commission. In chapters 28, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus brought purpose to his people, to you and to me. My second and final 
principle for tonight is Jesus came to make a personal appeal to his people. You may ask, what does that purpose look like? How do we live out this new life? I find the answer to be simple. We love as he loves. We are called to live as Christ, Christ like love, characters that is bound in love, love for a father and his people. Maybe you are saying to yourself, this sounds hard. How can I do this every day? We live in such a broken world, and not only have we sinned, but we are sinned against. Let us not forget that we get angry or selfish once things are way. How are we to be a light in this dark world when our lives are already so cloudy? Fortunately, God already knows all of our sin, our pitfalls, our struggles, our eternal battles. He has equipped us with a helper, the Holy Spirit. God knows living in this world is challenging and that there is a battle to be waged in each of his children between our own selfish desires and our spirit-led desires. But God does not give up on us. He loves, empowers, sanctifies, comforts, and lives through his people and does not let them go. I'd be embarrassed if you counted the number of times I have failed as a daughter, sister, wife, friend, co-worker, for the times I've not taken care of the needy and broken. But the Lord our God does not consider me a failure, but instead a beloved daughter of Christ. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, what keeps you clinging to your old self? What lies about your identity are you still believing? What wounds continue to fester because of the desire to hold back forgiveness? God's word is perfect and Jesus is merciful and glorious. As you turn to him throughout this study by spending time in his word, in prayer, Allow the Holy Spirit to guide you to a new freedom, a freedom where Jesus washes away your old identity, sin, wounds, tendencies as you learn to rejoice in the fact that you belong to our almighty God. There is nothing you have done or can do to earn this. It's not about striving or pursuing his favor, but instead resting in him, following his ways. Because Jesus' ways are righteous, God's word in his personal is his a personal appeal to you. It reveals who he is, what he desires, and your part in his glorious eternal plan. The gift of eternal life with Christ is unexpected. God is personally inviting us to live with him in righteousness for eternity. He is not condemning us for our laundry list of sins, but loving us. He is including us and is present with us right now. Through the gift of God's Son, Jesus Christ, who came to live among us and die in our place, we have the assurance of an eternal relationship with Him, and we get to enjoy His presence, power, and promises today. So the Gospel of Matthew and the entire Bible is our story, an unexpected story, a never-ending one, which we get to enjoy today, tomorrow, and forever. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to be here and study um, the Gospel of Matthew, Lord. God, I just pray that you would just be with us as we go to our discussion groups, and that you would just continue to walk with us. In your name we pray, amen. So I want to talk to you a little bit before we send you out to your discussion groups about um, what we do here at BSF. So, and why class is set up the way that it is so that our new people understand um, what's going on and then our veteran members can kind of be refreshed because it feels a little weird tonight because this is what we did last year. So, um, BSF stands for Bible Study Fellowship. It's a global Bible study organization. All BSF classes around the world will be studying Matthew this year. So, we're joining over 40,000 people studying the gospel. BSF has a four-fold approach. Um, to studying the scripture. This ensures that you will be going over the same passage of scripture four times each week if you um, complete your lesson in 10 class. So the first step is to um, answer questions from the scripture, which is what you do in your daily or weekly all at once. No judgment. Sometimes I do that. Personal Bible study by reading the passage and answering the questions on your own. And then the next step is to listen which involves listening to Connor or myself give a lecture um, over the scripture at the start of the BSF class or watch a video of a teaching later, depending on how class is structured um, that week. The third step is to discuss the passage of scripture in your discussion group, which we'll go to in just a moment. And then the final step is to read notes over the passage to learn more. 
So each step should hopefully bring a new, deeper, and hopefully in a different insight into the passage. I know for me, discussion is like, I'm like, oh, why didn't I think about that before? Um, so that's a great time to have those moments. And um, we just hope that you're able to enjoy this. We know that BSF um, helps us do, um, to undo, uh, do life with the Lord and to walk with him. And um, we hope that you're able to enjoy that this year with us. So.